We live in a world where it's offensive to preach the gospel of Jesus and to talk about his name. And I'm here to talk about it. Welcome to the Jesus is Offensive podcast. Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Jesus is Offensive podcast. I'm your host, Taylor Warfelman, as always. Welcome back. Uh, hope everyone is doing well. Hope everyone had a good week off, uh, unexpected week off, but uh, you know, stuff happens. Um, if you follow the Instagram, I'm sorry. <laughs> I did say, I'm like, yeah, there's going to be a podcast out. I'm going to record it this weekend and it never happened. So apologize for that. I had to repent of that, not being a man of my word, but um, we're here now and uh, we're going to get after it today. So appreciate everyone who's tuning in. Um, I hope that in the week we were gone, you were able to catch up if you are behind it all in the podcast. And I pray that it's still blessing you and um, making you think and and just taking you deeper with God. Um so yeah, uh, a few new updates here. Um, things are well. Uh, I actually just got a new computer yesterday. So praise God for that because um, just with the work that I do outside of the podcast and also with the podcast, my old computer was kind of just taking a slow poop. Um, so praise God, we got a new computer. It, it makes zero noise. So hopefully there won't be any humming. And I think for bringing on guests and stuff in the future, it's going to be really helpful uh, to just have more RAM, more abilities. Uh, I'm not a computer nerd, so I don't know all the right words, but uh, I, I have friends that know stuff. So they told me what to get. <laughs> um, but yeah, I hope you guys are doing well. Um, I want to announce something. It's not super a fish yet, but I just, it's kind of coming to my mind um, that so on the Instagram, if you're not connected with us, go ahead and connect. Jesus is offensive. That's that's our at. Um, but yeah, I've been running once in a while these kind of prayer requests. And for a while, they were kind of just private between me. Um, but I've ended up sharing them with a few people that I trust that are kind of my prayer warriors, I guess, unofficially. Um, and it's been really awesome, I think, just to have collective people praying for you guys out there. And uh, I really want to start something new where not only do we do prayer requests, but we also do um, answers, prayer, prayer. I don't know what the word is. Like when, when the prayers are actually answered, I, I just, I really want to see that turnaround and to show that God really is moving. Um, because oftentimes we pray for people and then it's like, well, did it get better? Like, did it change? Did it, you know what I mean? Like, so we want to see that it's helping, that it's making an impact. Um, so we're probably going to be doing something like that. So if you're interested, if you need prayer, go ahead and connect with us. You also always can email us if uh, if you're not on Instagram, which is hello at jesusoffensive.com. I love connecting with you guys and um, seriously, reach out. I love it. I will do my best to get back as soon as I possibly can. But yeah, so again, sorry for no episode last week. Just been a little bit busy, um, good busy, but definitely want to continue to keep the podcast first and to continue to do the work that God has set out for me to do. So without further ado, let's pray and we'll hop right into it. Dear Lord God, um, thank you for this podcast. Thank you for this opportunity, God. Thank you for this incredible day where there's actually sun, <laughs> um, Lord, and uh God, I just pray that you would bless the podcast today, Lord, that everyone listening, Lord, would receive something through it, God, and that their lives would be blessed, their lives would be touched, God, and that, um, yeah, God, just give people uh, ears to hear right now, Lord, to hear, to hear your truth, God. I pray that you would be with me in my words, Lord, that anything that is not of your spirit, Lord, would be a race from these people's minds, Lord, and that I would be able to just glorify you in everything um, I say and do. So I pray all this in your mighty name, amen. Awesome. Um, so yeah, today, uh, last episode, we talked about being molded like clay, right? And I hope, um, you guys got something out of that episode for me. That's a very important message. And I felt like it was one that needed to be heard. And, um, yeah, I, I think it, it just, it really encompasses what it looks like to surrender, even though I could do maybe a different episode on surrender where we talk about all the hard verses. And we're going to talk about some of those today, but really it's the beautiful part of when we let go, God molds us and creates us to be this incredible vessel full of purpose, full of meaning, um, aside from, you know, what we could have done and the destruction that we could have faced if we would have kept in our own ways. So 
With that being said, I really felt the leading this week to talk about kind of some personal testimony that I've not shared on here. I mean, there's been parts that I have shared, but really putting it all together. So this is not my testimony of salvation necessarily. It it, it has a part to it, but uh, obviously I've already shared that. I think it was episode six of season one. And obviously I probably could update that by now because your testimony is always changing, always growing. And, and I think... Um, that's a sign that God is moving. You know, I don't say that in pride, but just all of our testimonies need to be progressing at every moment because if they're not, then what is God doing in your life? Because a testimony is just testifying of what Jesus is doing in your life. So I would say for me, it's always growing. Sometimes it's, you know, taking a step back and then two steps forward. But um, today I really want to talk about the idea of what I've lost following Christ and what I've gained. Um, and this is something I preach to people in person, but nothing that I've really shared on the podcast. So obviously, you know, my issues and the things I've went through and my minor bits of persecution have nothing to do or not even close with the persecution that these people face in China and and in these Middle Eastern um, countries and all over the world, frankly. Um, But still, it still is my testimony. And, and uh, until physical persecution comes to America, which it will, this is this is what I've got, you know, and this episode isn't fully on really persecution. Um, It's more of the cost of being a disciple in my testimony, my experience. And something that I've been really liking to do lately is when I read the Bible, I really like to, if I'm reading something that I have experience and I'm like, yeah, this is true. I always, I start praying like, God, I bear witness to this. Like, yes, this is true. I, I declare that your words are true, that you are trustworthy and true. Um, and that's how I feel about some of these passages that I'm going to share and just about, um, what has happened in my life that he is trustworthy. And that's kind of the message I want to get across to you guys is that you can trust him and, and he is trustworthy and he is worthy of your, um, adoration, your trust, your faith, um, so yeah, what I've lost following Christ. Um, before we get going into personal testimony, of course, we're always going to start it out with Bible. So let's go over to Luke 9, 23 to 26. Now, if you don't know, Luke 9, 23 is basically unofficially the Jesus offensive verse. Um, I have it on all of our tags for all of our clothing. I mean, that might change someday, but right now it's it's on the back of every single tag. So if you own a shirt, if you own a hoodie, if you own a... Um, yeah, wait, that's it. If you own a t-shirt or a hoodie, um, look on the back of the tag and it says Luke 9, 23. Now, the reason I picked that is you're going to see, I'm going to read it for you right now. Um, now I know I'm kind of like grabbing this out of context. I wouldn't say it's actually out of context because I've actually read the context and I've determined that, okay, this is okay to, to start here. Um, but again, I, I, I always like to preface with saying that cause I'm big on let's read the whole chapter type thing. But Um, so Jesus is talking to his disciples here. Um, then he said to them all, and he had just said that he has to die. Uh, He's going to have to face death for, um, for his message, et cetera. And of course the disciples are probably a little confused here, but he says to them, then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. So obviously that's why we came out with the die to yourself t-shirt. If you haven't seen that, you can check it out on our website, but it basically says die to yourself backwards because whenever you look in the mirror, it's reminding you to deny yourself, die to yourself, deny yourself. It's kind of the same thing. It's just different times, different wording. Oh, but the point is, is whoever now, this is what really irritates me. I just heard a teaching from someone the other day. It wasn't a teaching to be quite honest. It was, it was a YouTuber talking and no offense, but it was totally off base. Um, so I have something stuck in my teeth. I'm like, what is going on? Okay. I got it. (laughs) Um, but he was saying, no, 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 guys, this doesn't mean all Christians. This just means anyone who wants to be a disciple. I'm like, dude, are you joking me? For one, we're all called to be disciples. Okay. Disciples are not the 12. Those were Jesus's disciples because he was a rabbi and you have to have 12 students to be a rabbi. Okay. Most people know this, but if you don't, that's why. But just because they were called disciples doesn't mean that we're not all called to be disciples. And the the way to, to rebuke this whole false doctrine of, well, we're not all called to be disciples is if you literally look in the Matthew account, he doesn't say disciples. He says, anyone who wants to follow me must do these things. So listen, if you want to follow Jesus, if you're going to call yourself a Christian, what must you do to be a Christian? Obviously we've talked about, you got to repent, you got to be baptized to be born again and all that stuff. But after that and before that, the whole part of this of that process of being born again is to surrender your life. See how you get to the surrender is by being born again, but surrendering your life is a decision you make, which is why even though 
um, the sinner's prayer is a totally unbiblical thing. Many people um, have begun their salvation walk with Jesus. Why? Because they were actually sincere when they told Jesus, I'm giving you my life, right? So he says, whoever wants to be my disciple, what what must they do? They must deny themselves, right? Like lower themselves to nothing and take up their cross and follow me. Meaning like, follow me to death, basically. And to take up your cross, that was a very humiliating thing. And that's where we get the word humble, right? So verse 24, for whoever wants to save their life, will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the father and of the holy angels. Wow. That's, that's, I mean, all those verses pack a punch and I don't even know which one is like stands out the most, but definitely the one that always like makes me have the most fear of God is when it says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory. Because I know the times that I don't want to say I've denied Jesus, but I've been ashamed of him in the way, in a way that I haven't brought him up in conversation or I've skirted out of conversations about him. Um, and I'm just being honest, like I'm, I've gotten a lot better over time, but there still have been times where I'm like, oh my gosh, God, forgive me. I just realized my heart is deceitful, but I was ashamed of you there. And I didn't want to say what I really was feeling or, or thinking or being true. And honestly, that was a part of this whole podcast. The reason I started this, because I realized that I had friends out there and who knows if they listen or not, but people that maybe I hadn't shared everything that I believed and maybe, you know, and now maybe I didn't have an opportunity. I was like, this is my chance to be unashamed. Like this is out there for the world. Like anyone can find it. Anyone can ridicule me you know, and, but I'm going to be unashamed because this is all out there. Like, I'm not going to delete it. Like who I am is out in the world. People know who I am. I'm not anyone different than you hear on this podcast. So, um, that's been big, but that's, that's huge. Like we can't be ashamed of him. Like how many times have you listener, like skirted around Jesus coming up or not really said, um, what you were feeling in that moment. I'm not just saying feeling, but what the Holy spirit was leading you to do. Um, or maybe again, was just avoiding talking about God in general. I mean, that is being ashamed of him, right? Like you talk about the things you love. You talk about, you know, your family, your friends, because you're not ashamed of them. So why don't we talk about God? Right. And so the thing that I really want to focus on in this message, however, is for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. So if in this life, if in this world, you're looking to save your life, that basically means to live your best life now, to do what you want, um, to have everything your heart desires, well, then you will lose your life. And I think that has two implications. One, you have no purpose on this earth, but it's also saying spiritually, you will have spiritual death, right? Which is damnation and hell. So you will lose your life if you seek to gain a life here on earth, right? And that's why the devil, when he came to Jesus, Um, when Jesus was being tempted by him in the desert, the devil offered him everything because he could give us anything on this earth. The devil can, but Jesus resisted because he knew that the heavenly thing was greater than the earthly thing. So whoever looks to save their life, to gain life here on earth, they will lose it spiritually. They will lose it in the second life. They will, they will lose everything. They will lose their purpose. They'll lose who they are. But whoever loses their life, right? Well, basically what verse 23 said, whoever denies their life and, and totally, um, forfeits their life, right? And says, you know what? This isn't worth anything to me. I'm, I, I'm going to give up my life. That is the person who will save it. Okay. So, and then what good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? So this is what I was saying. Like, and some, some versions say lose or forfeit their soul, right? So if you have the whole world, you're going to die someday. And in the end, Did you have God though? And basically what Jesus is saying here in a nutshell is that the two are incompatible. You cannot have the world and you cannot have God. Or in other words, let's even simplify it even more. You can't have your own desires and the desires and the will of God. It's either his will or your will. There's no combo. There's no mix. There's no partnership. Um, And so these are really tough words. And he's saying, listen, if you want to follow me, this is like the, this is like, day one type stuff. Now, most Christians, we get this on day, you know, year 10, where it's like, oh my gosh, I'm not surrendered. But this was day one. Like she's like, yo, if you want to follow me, this is what it looks like. You have to deny yourself, give up your life, take up your cross, forfeit your very life and all your desires and follow after me. Okay. So this is really big. And so he talks about this more in a few chapters down, Luke 14, 25 to 35. So Let's go to there. Again, Luke 14, 25 to 35. I hope you guys are following along 
I never know if anyone's actually following along when I do these podcasts, but all good, no matter what. Um, that's why I like to just read it straight through. But um, large crowds are traveling with Jesus and turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. So he's not talking to the disciples. He's talking to the crowds that were following him. Okay. So if you want to follow Christ, this is what it takes. Now, again, people will say, well, what does that even mean? Okay. What it's basically saying here, because at the end he says, yes, even their own life. Listen, I don't hate my life in the way of like a self-hating, like I want to kill myself. The idea is that you hate your life so much, meaning that your life to you is useless. I don't want your desires are dead. Your will is dead. Um, everything that you wanted in your life, you throw that to the side and you say, God, I'm your servant, whatever you want. That's the idea. Even Jesus did that. He's like, you know, God, take this cup from me, if you will, when he was in the garden, not wanting to die. But he said, but let your will be done. So he hated his life for us. Right. And so when it says anyone who comes to me and hates uh, and does not hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters. Yes, even his own life, such person cannot be my, my disciple. He's saying, listen, if you value any of these relationships over mine, like let's say God tells you to do something that your parents may want to approve of. And I'm not talking about sin. I'm just saying like, let's say God's like, hey, I want you to go to Africa and preach to these people. And your parents are like, no, I don't, you shouldn't do that. Like that's dangerous, this, that, and the other thing. If you value your parents and what they have to say over God, then you can't be his disciples because later he's going to say, you can't serve two masters, right? You either are devoted to one and you hate the other, or you hate the other and are devoted to the other one. The point is, is you cannot have two voices in your ear. So listen, it's not a, it's not a despising kind of hate. Like, oh my gosh, I hate them so much. It's meaning you consider them nothing. Even your own life, you consider nothing compared to Christ. So what if, and this is perfectly illustrated in Muslim communities, right? When when one person in a Muslim community becomes Christian, they're totally kicked out of their communities. They're ridiculed by their family and they're rejected in most cases and, and sometimes tried to kill, be killed in, in extreme cases. So the point is, is that person, before they made the decision for Christ, they had to realize, okay, this is literally going to split me from my family. So she had, she or he had to literally hate father, hate mother, hate wife, hate children, hate brothers, hate sisters, because she valued, she loved God more than all those things so that it was easy. Not easy. I don't want to say easy, but she considered the loss of those relationships a great, um, as a greater risk than losing God. Right? So super important. And, and we don't hear this message preached often that literally he's not saying this is a good idea. He's saying you can't be my disciple unless this is the way you live. And, and I got to check myself with this too. It's like, dang, like I have to forsake all of these things and consider my life, my desires, my selfishness rubbish, right? And, and follow everything according to God's will. And then he throws on this little tidbit and who does not, and whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Basically, again, if you cannot follow me to death, if you're not devoted to me, right? If he's saying you have to hate your own life, then that means I'm already dead. If you're born again, you're already dead. You died to that old life, right? The point of being born again is to die to your old life. And now you're alive in Christ. So if they kill me, if they beat me, my body is not mine. I'm already dead. I'm, I'm a, I'm a child of the King. I am a citizen of heaven, right? Verse 28, suppose one of, so he gives a parable here of what he's kind of trying to say. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish or propose or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. <clears throat> so what is he saying here? What This is where we get the idea of <clears throat> count the cost. <clears throat> Excuse me. And basically what he's saying is, listen, if you do not evaluate what's at stake in following God, then one, you're not going to have a sincere conversion. And two, you can't be my disciple. So again, he's saying in the same way, 
Those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. And that does, doesn't mean you need to go naked, sell all your clothes, sell your house, go live on the street. It's like, God, I gave up everything. No, the point is, is saying everything is yours, right? So you can live, let's say you're a servant of a mansion, right? You can use all the things in the mansion. It's amazing, but none of those things are yours, okay? So it's not that I have to just get rid of all this. Now, if God tells me to do that, yes, that's 100% what he's saying. The point is, is it's his. If God says, hey, Taylor, tomorrow I want you to throw away your new computer. Okay, it's yours, so go ahead, God. It's not mine. I'm just a servant serving in your own house. Now, this is easier said than done, but I'm giving this picture so that we can understand it in our terms um, today. But he's saying you need to count the cost because to follow me is going to cost you everything, everything. And if you don't evaluate that, then one, when you convert, it's not going to be real because God doesn't accept that conversion. But two, you're not actually going to have a sincere conversion and therefore your life is not going to change because you did not consider everything in your life to be rubbish compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ. So, and, and this is why it's actually very interesting, um, not to get into like gender and stuff, but, um, I've, I've listened to some interesting things and, and people are saying that, you know, this is one reason why uh, a lot of men are slower to receive the gospel. And you look at churches, they're filled with, you know, five to one women to men, right. Uh, in a lot of cases, which is beautiful. And, and that's amazing of the women. But the thing is with a man is men are very logical. We don't operate off emotion. So literally men want to know what is the cost? What is it going to take to do this thing? Right. This is why we're good analytically and we're good at building things and stuff because we are able to determine, okay, can I do this or not? And so many men, I believe don't convert and it looks bad and it's like, man, women must just accept the gospel more. But I think actually when a man converts, his conversion is much more sincere. And I don't mean this in a sexist way. Women are just as, some women are just as sincere, but I actually think it's still 50, 50 on the amount of women and men that follow Christ. But it looks so heavily weighted on women in the church because when you operate off emotion, it's like, oh my gosh, the love of Jesus. Okay, God, I want you. But men are really looking at the cost. And I've seen this even in my own life, helping people. It's it's the same with us. Five to one or, or four to one women to men. But all the men that do come, they really get on fire. They really rarely fall away because they are able to analytically look and see what is this going to cost me? And they they really truly realize, most of them, if they're preached the correct gospel, of course, that they're going to have to give up everything. And so this is why a lot of men don't are, have pushback. Like I've met so many men that they believe Jesus, they know he's true. And, and I'm like, well, why don't you want to get born again? And they can't answer that. But I know deep down, they know the cost and they know they're not willing to give up things. Even if they're not sin, they're just not willing. I hope that makes sense. I'm not trying to get political here or anything, but it truly is the difference between men and women. I think, and I just found that very interesting because Jesus was also clear when preaching to really sincerely break down the cost. And I think in churches, we don't break down the cost of following Jesus. It's just like, come to the altar and just give him everything you have. But, and that's beautiful, but they're not explaining the cost, what it will cost you to follow God. Like this will cost you everything. It's like when you go to war, like you have to evaluate, like, yeah, I might come back alive, but I'm going to expect that I will die. Because that's the cost of going to war. That's the cost of being a soldier. In the same way, following Jesus, you got to know what it costs you to be a disciple of Jesus. So again, if you, you have to sum this up, to come to Christ, you have to evaluate, am I willing to give up everything? Am I willing to hate father, mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters for his sake? Am I willing to hate even my own life, my own desires, my own dreams? Right? And this is where people get stuck. This is why there's lukewarmness. This is why there's not sincere conversions because A, this is not preached or B, people don't want to sincerely give this up. So again, it's it's tough, but this is this is the reality. I just thought of something, so I was just writing it down. So he finishes this in saying, salt is good, but if it loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He's basically saying, listen, if, you know, he uses salt a lot to talk about people. So if it loses its saltiness, basically what he's saying is it's not valuable for anything. So it's thrown out. So if you are not willing to give up everything and be that salt and light, then you're you're not um, worth anything to God. And therefore you can't be his disciples. You're thrown out. He says, whoever has an ear, let them hear. This is very tough preaching here. 
Um, but this is sincere. And these are Jesus' words. We can't skirt around them. We can't say, well, he really meant this. You're, no, this is what he said. This is exactly what he said. And this is exactly what it means. And we're going to stick to that. We're not going to, we're not going to dummy it down. We're not going to water it down. So now with that framework in mind, I want to share because I think it could be encouraging to others and, and, uh, just also to testify that these words are, are tried and true, um, that uh, especially verse 24 of Luke nine, um, where it says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever wants to lose their life will save it. So I want to share a little bit of the things that I've experienced. So I broke it down into four categories. Okay. So what I've lost following Christ, dreams, desires, relationships, comfort. And I'll break down each one and I, I, I'm praying that this really inspires you guys. And again, I still have a long ways to go. I'm still learning. I'm still on the journey, right? Like someday I could probably do this sermon again in four years and have totally different things on here um, that God has done in my life. But the point is, is I want to testify that God's words are true and they are true. He is faithful and, and he sticks to his promises. So if the word says this, these sound like harsh words, but I, that's why I love what it says. If you want to lose your life, you'll save it because there is joy after the morning. There is, um, there is beauty and there is fulfillment following Christ. The upfront cost is everything, right? Like remember, uh, Jesus talks about that pearl, right? If you find that pearl, um, you know, he gives up everything else. Like this will cost you everything, but you will have that pearl of life. You will have the greatest thing. So, you know, when you save up all your money and you really want to buy this one thing because it's so worth it, it, it like a car, like $30,000 for a car, that's a lot of money. You can barely even get like a brand new car for that price, but you've saved it up because you've seen that, man, yeah, this is a lot of work. There's a lot of money, but it's worth it. So in the same way for God, we're giving up everything, but we're getting something that's w- worth more than everything we get. We can't even purchase um, having a relationship with God. You know you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that in a theological way. I'm, I'm more saying like, if you put them on a scale, like everything I have, everything I, I love and everything I desire in my whole life, I put that on a scale with Jesus. Like Jesus would totally weigh that thing out of proportion because he's still so much greater and he's worth more. He's so precious. So again, dreams, desires, relationship, comfort. I'm going to just talk about each one. So I'll start with dreams. So before I started following Christ, um, when I was about eight, my parents gave me a tape camera. So, you know, you record on tapes and I would make Lego stop motion videos all the time, narrating them. And they were fun. They were wholesome, uh, great stuff. And there's nothing wrong with any of this stuff. I just, I'm throwing it out there to show that God changes you. And so after that, from a young age, you know, I did theater and, and growing up and did a lot of acting. And from that age, I always wanted to be a filmmaker. I really never changed what I wanted to be. Now, there was a time when I was like, maybe I'll study religion in college because I always had a love for, for God and for preaching and stuff like that. But in general, I always wanted to be a filmmaker. And I, I always posed it as, and I was sincere in this, but hey, I want to make movies for Jesus. I want to make Christian movies that aren't cheesy. I remember that I literally did a presentation in high school. I want to do Christian movies that aren't cheesy for God. So that was one of my dreams, being a filmmaker. And at the ender, at the ender, at the, um, and at the end part of my life before really having my true conversion and turning, you know, you've heard it in my testimony, um, before truly being born again, um, Although I called myself, I've called myself a Christian my whole life, but before truly surrendering my life to Jesus, there it is. Um, these, this is what I'm talking about. So what I've lost following Christ, this, everything I'm about to talk about in the next 15, 20 minutes is all things that before I was truly surrendered to God, this was when I was lukewarm. So, um, yet towards the latter half of my lukewarm lifestyle, I really started to make waves in, in filmmaking. I had a good, um, internship slash job where I was making good money. I was doing work that I really liked and, uh, it was really fun. Although again, what does the devil start tricking you into? I started compromising and working on a few projects that I'm like, you know, I really don't want my name on that. But instead of standing up, I was ashamed of God, like it talks about in Luke nine. And I gave into those projects. So, you know, that was one of my dreams. And when you have dreams that are not of God, you end up doing things that you wouldn't do because you want to secure those dreams so bad. So another dream, you know, obviously to be well known, I I wanted to be a great filmmaker someday, you know, and I wouldn't say I wanted to be famous, but I wanted to be really good at my craft, you know, and there was pride there. I wanted people to see that I was good at filmmaking, you know, and, and I wanted to work in Hollywood. I wanted to make big budget movies. I wanted to work on sets and my life was totally going that way. I mean, I remember telling my dad, like, 
Hey dad, like we live in LA dad, you, you and mom are so supportive. Like there's no way I can't make it in Hollywood. Even if I try for 10 years, I have nothing to lose. Right. I'm, I'm here. Eventually I'll get my foot in the door. So that was my dr dream. And I've bought so many cameras. Um, I have loved filmmaking. I've never wavered. I mean, that was a huge dream for me. And, um, I'll get to this a little later, but even when a few years ago, before God told us to move, we had just talked about moving for fun. I was very like, well, I'm not going because Hollywood's here and the movie making industry is here. Yeah. I'd love to move, but no, like I, I need to be here. So these were my dreams. Now my desires were similar. It's kind of the same thing, but you know, status, you know, like Instagram, for instance, I wanted followers. I, I remember, uh, with filmmaking comes photography as well. It's kind of all in the same vein. I want people to love my photos. I want people to follow me. I want to be, I want to be the next Joe Greer or whatever. If you know who that is, he's a really famous photographer. And, um, and also my desires were just selfishness, my own life, right? I want to do what I want to do. Like, I remember when I got out of college, I was like, I don't want to move home. Like I love my parents, but I want to have my own life. I want to do my own thing. I don't want anyone telling me what to do. I want to have fun, right? That was one of my desires, fun. Um, and some of my other desires were I loved movies. Uh, I grew up not watching any R-rated movies because of my parents, but in college you start watching some R-rated movies and thinking, well, they're not that bad, even though they're saying the F word like 50 times. Um, and bad music. I've talked about this in my own testimony, but this was also my desire. I mean, yes, I knew that rap the whole time was bad and it was not fruitful, but even songs that, okay, one cuss word, it's not that big of a deal. Um, I really love this beat. Oh, this is such a cool song. And even music because I wanted to fit in with people, um, you know, and, and, oh, well, they like this music. And if I play this music, they're going to think I'm a loser, you know? And so these are some of the things I've lost following Christ. Um, and, and I'll explain that in a sec, but I'm just kind of reading through it. relationships, right? Like I, I, I wanted friends. I mean, I had friends, <laughs> uh, I had a good family, still have a great family. Um, but no weird blood, no awkwardness between other family members, um, clients, right. For work. Um, yeah, people knew me as a Christian, but I wasn't shaking any feathers. So they were fine work, you know, using me and then comfort, right. Normalcy, right. What did I, what did I lose following Christ? Normalcy. My life was so normal before. Everyone loved us. Everyone thought, oh, they're the nice Christian family that raises their hands at church in the front row. We love them. Oh, they're so awesome. They're so great. Oh, they're so good at acting. And, and I'm not saying this to brag. It's just, this is, this is what we lost. The fame, the fortune, the, you know, fame isn't just being famous in the whole world. It's everyone has their own sense of fame in their own little communities, right? And everyone wants to be known. Everyone wants to be the best. Everyone wants to be the most liked. What else in the ter in terms of comfort? My will. This was huge. When I turned to Christ truly and 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 became surrendered, I lost my will. And my will was I put it in the comfort section because in comfort I wanted to do what I want to do. That's comfortable. When you just live your life for you, that's that's comfort. That's your will. That's like oh, life's awesome, right? But I gave that up and I said, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do, right? And you know, as you guys know, like moving. I also lost my house, my lifestyle. Like I never thought we'd leave California. Don't get me wrong. I love Montana. I had thought about moving here as like a pipe dream, but legitimately, like I said, I knew that filmmaking's in Hollywood. I don't want to leave. This is where, you know, I want to do the LA thing and, and make movies. And so again, these are some of the things I lost following Christ. So now I'm going to kind of backtrack because I've listed them and just tell a few stories of how that all came to be. So with filmmaking, what happened there? So when we got the word that we were going to move, you know, obviously you start thinking there's no film industry in Montana. And so praise God, after I got born again, the beautiful thing that I want to encourage you guys is it's so scary reading these verses. Like you're saying I have to lose my life. I have to surrender it all. And yes, you have to make that upfront decision, but God changes your desires. God literally, and I'm going to attest to this so hard. He changes what you want. There's this amazing song by Maverick City. Um, and they're kind of like, talking spontaneously. And he's like, um, you give us the desires of our heart pause. But then he says, you give us what to, to want. You give us what to crave. Like he implants that in us. So yes, it says he gives us the desires of his heart, but, but it's because when we give our heart to God, his desires become our desires. So of course he wants to give those to us because it's according to his will. Um, and so again, when I decided to surrender and become that moldable clay and to remove my hardness and say, God mold me, this is when all of these dreams started to crumble, right? I realized we we're moving. Okay, well, I'm done making movies. I, I will never be a film director. 
I know that, you know, there were a side of me that was like, well, maybe it'll still happen even after getting born again. But it's like, nope, that's over. And there's a really cool story behind that. We're um, having a prayer meeting one night and I get this text. You know, I think I am going to name drop. Normally I don't like to name drop because it's, I don't want it to come off pride pull, but I really think it benefits the story. And I think it's going to make this even more understandable. And I think just relatable. So if you guys don't know, Christopher Nolan, okay, he's the director of the Dark Knight series, uh, Inception, all these, you know, movies that I really used to love and admire in my old life. And uh, I would still say their masterpieces are there. Is there stuff in the movies that I don't approve of anymore and that I don't watch those movies anymore? Yeah. Um, but point being is he's an incredible filmmaker and obviously probably my favorite filmmaker, probably the one I most looked up to style wise and, and just everything. And so anyways, I'm sitting on the couch and we're having this prayer meeting. This is like six months before we're about to leave to Montana. And I get this text from, um, this guy and he's like, Hey, um, I got your number from blah, blah, blah. And, uh, we need a PA down in San Diego tomorrow morning. Can you do it? Um, that's, I think that was pretty much it. Now this person was Christopher Nolan's assistant director. Okay. That's huge. That's like wild. Um, and of course the old me inside was like, this is everything I've ever wanted. Like this is my foot in the door right here. This is my connection. This is like the big leagues. This ain't like a B movie. This is like the big leagues, you know? Um, I don't mean the B movie, like B's. I mean like B the letter <laughs> there's a movies and B movies. B movies are cheap, low budget movies. So I was like, wow. But it was crazy because this was like a few years after being born again, obviously something inside was like, I, I don't, I don't want to do that. And it was so bizarre because this was like the dream that little Taylor, his whole life had wanted, right? This was everything he desired. This was totally the connection that he was looking for. I mean, this was beyond crazy. And I could have justified and said, Oh, this is God. This is God. But something inside of me, that little still voice was like, I don't want to do that. I, I don't, I don't want to be in that scene anymore. And so at the prayer meeting, I kind of told everyone like, Hey, this is what happened. Can you guys pray and see if you get anything from God, um, prophetically and see if, you know, is this something I should do? And everyone kind of got like a no, like, and they felt bad. But then I told them later, I was like, no, I actually felt that I should say no. And I had no idea why you see when you follow God and his will becomes your will, you do things that make no sense to the world. Like telling this story now, if I told this to just like the normal nonchalant, like people would be like, dude, that was a stupid career move. But the problem was, is at that time now, I was not looking to better my career. I was looking to better the kingdom. And so I considered my life worthless. I decided that my I hated my life. I didn't want the Hollywood lifestyle. I didn't want those desires. I decided that I wanted to lose my life even though that was a dumb decision and cost my career and Taylor, you'll never be a film director. No, I consider my life rubbish and I consider God's calling on my life greater. And that's why the, the scariest part of the whole story was putting it in God's hands and saying, God, whatever you want to speak to our friends who prayed for me and ask God, then I'm going to obey that. And that was surrendering my will. Again, that was losing my life. And again, I, maybe I'm not making this like abundantly clear because I'm not like an emotional person. Oh, well, I'm getting more emotional lately, but, um, but this was my dream my whole life. Like if, if anyone asked me like, what do you want to be? Like, I always knew this was it. Uh, very sought after dream, did a lot of filmmaking, a lot of videos, a lot of work, a lot of, and I'm going to, there's a caveat to that. And there's a end part, which is beautiful, but you know, I really gave up all of that, not knowing what, uh, the future had. And so that was, that was a big story. So another story that I put on here, and it's funny because I didn't even have it when I was writing, but I told God, I was like, God, please remind me of anything. Um, and this kind of, well, I'm going to actually save that one for after this next story. Um, so desires, right? Status followers, right? I was talking about Instagram a little bit. This is just a small one, but again, it's just a sign of, of following God, you know, there was a fear at first of posting things on Instagram that were, what's the word, uh, that could rustle feathers, right? Like I, I started posting stuff about God at the time, which was not very smart. I did start posting some stuff about politics, um, which I quickly got away from. But it's so funny because every month or so, I'll, I'll be reminded of someone from college or something like that. And I'll go and, 
and look at their page and see if they still follow me. And I found that they've now unfollowed me. Right. And this happens like every month. And I can see how the devil would try to use this to feel rejected or feel like, you know, even my old friends, like what? Like, I thought we were like, cool. Like, yeah, you believe maybe something different from me, but, but I realized again, my desire, I had to lose my desires and let God's desires come in. So God's desire is to preach the gospel, to, to speak about his name, to be honest, to put him on the internet, to, to, for my Instagram to not be different from who I actually am. So that's why I started posting about God, Bible verse, and not even anything crazy, but like just things about God, some things about abortion. And every time I look up at new people and I've been unfollowed by people that I was genuinely a good friend with in college. Um, and that's, that's hard. But again, I had to lose those desires of being loved and of status and of having friends and even creators, right? Like I'm a photographer on my main account. If you don't follow me, um, that's kind of what I do. And people follow me and I've had some people follow me and I'm like, Oh my gosh, they're such a big name. That's so cool. And then God's like, Hey, post that Isaiah Saldivar video on, on your story. And I'm like, okay, God, I just got to do it because the moment I start valuing my life, I'm trying to save my life again. I'm trying to save what people think of me. I'm trying to save their perception. I'm trying to save my identity, but my identity is not of this world. It's not a photographer. It's of God. And yeah, I've had some of those big names unfollow me after. And it is what it is. And it's still a fear sometimes, but I have to continue and stick with God's desire for my life and losing my life, losing my desires, losing my followers, losing my status. And it was the same thing with movies, right? Like God really made it clear that some of these movies I love, like guys, I want to be a film director. I'm a big movie snob. He's like, no, you can't watch that. You can't watch that. If it takes my name in vain, you can't watch that. You can't watch that. You can't watch that. And that was hard too. But again, I didn't want to save my life anymore. I said, I'm losing my life, God, whatever you want, whatever your will. I want to save my life. I want, I want to have a good life in you, even if it costs everything. And so I, I gave up those things. And, and one of those things that I'll talk about that I was just reminded of, hold on, I'm going to get a little sip of coffee here. One of those things was again, another thing that I haven't talked about because I don't want pride to come in about it, but now it's been a few years. So, um, in high school, uh, my first car I bought was an old Corvette. It was a 1976 white Corvette. Sounds crazy, but it was like seven grand. It's not like <laughs> it looks flashy, you know what I mean? But um, I worked all summer for it, worked really hard. I really wanted it, didn't pray about it, um, and got it. And I had that Corvette for seven years when we moved to Montana, I sold it. But there was a time after getting born again and after truly surrendering that God told me, Hey, I want you to sell it. And I was like, that was really hard because let's be honest. What did the Corvette say about me? I'm cool. I'm, I'm a, I'm a cool guy. Like, I have a fast car, like the pride was all there, you know, and, and God's like, yeah, I want you to sell it. I'm like, but that's like one of my cool things. Like, you know, (laughs) again, I'm I'm embarrassing myself right now, but that's, that's just how it is. Like, oh, but you know, girls will think I'm cool if I have a Corvette or, you know, like, let's be honest, we're all human. Like I'm, I'm just being real, like, because I want you to be able to relate, but God's like, no, I want you to sell it. So I'm like, okay, God, again, I did not value my life. I decided I'm going to lose my life. I'm going to lose my status. I'm going to lose my coolness because I'm believing this promise, God, that if I lose it, that I will save my life. And, and I, I've, I had realized at this point that God, you're so faithful. So I'm like, okay. So I list the Corvette on Craigslist. And it was so funny because I didn't get a single person hit me up and it wasn't like, I didn't have it like overpriced and get a single person hit me up. And then one day I just felt like God was like, okay, you can take it off. And I was like, what? And I realized it was like an Abraham moment. I might've talked about this on the podcast before, but that he wanted to see if I was willing right? What did he, what did that verse say? You know, if you don't hate your father, mother, even your own life, he wanted to see if, if I had counted the cost, remember how I was saying, when you count the cost, you realize that nothing is yours. You give it all to God. God's like, well, Taylor is the Corvette mine. Okay. If it's mine, then, then I want to sell it. And that was a test to see one, would I do it? And would I be faithful? Just like Abraham, when he offered Isaac, right? He didn't end up killing Isaac, but God wanted to see, are you faithful? Because If I'm the God that gives, I can also take away. And we have to be willing for that to happen, for God to take away whenever he wants, because it's his, the Corvette's his. And and any fighting that I did with God was unjustified because the Corvette was his. When I had gotten baptized, when I had repented, when I had given him my life, when I had surrendered, I had inherent or not inherently, but um, 
in a roundabout way said that that's his. I didn't necessarily say those words, but everything is his. Now, later on, a few years later, I, I do end up selling the Corvette and I list it on Craigslist and I get a million people hitting me up. So I know that that was God, that no one reached out about the Corvette, but he let it simmer on there for a few weeks or even like a month because he wanted to see if I was willing. And again, once I got rid of it, I mean, it, it was still sad. I mean, I know I couldn't bring it to Montana, but one, God had loosed me from that hold a little bit more. And today I never think about it again. And I, I want to share that too, because there's a good side to all this. When you really let go of things in your life and you surrender and you let it all go, I, I've never thought about the Corvette again. Like me and my sister were literally just talking in the car. She just sold her Jeep and she's like, oh, I miss whipping around in my Jeep. And I was like, you know, what's so funny. I never think about my Corvette ever. I remember making a video the night I sold it. I was like, it, it was like a video to myself. I don't really do this kind of stuff, but I was like, Taylor, if you ever miss the Corvette, just remember these things. And I kind of like talked and just said how faithful God was and that he even allowed me to have such a fun car for seven years. And it was a really cool car. It was really fun for that season, but I never think about it again because God changes your desires. So yeah, and that's another cool story. Um, let's go over to the relationships, what I've lost following Christ. So when I got on this journey, I'm going to be very candid. So if you're one of my friends listening, I love you. Um, I'm just sharing what actually happened and, and, um, I love all you guys I have nothing against you. And I understand this is just the enemy, but, uh, in college, you know, when I got on this journey of really surrendering, um, and of course it, it had come because we had learned new stuff from an organization called the last reformation. Okay. And I'm not putting my name on them or anything like that, but they opened our eyes to the book of acts, to baptism, to things, um, to, the life I live now being real, the life that I read in the Bible being real and then the church is deceived and it's true. My life looks more like the Bible than it ever has. So like I, I am thankful to that organization for that. But with that being said, when I got started in that, I wanted to share it with my friends. We were, I was talking to them about baptism. I was so zealous and excited. And now I have friends sending me, Hey, you're in a cult, you know, or, or this isn't true. And, you know, I'm really praying for you. Hope you're going to be okay. And, and, also a lot of friends starting to reject me and not wanting to hang out with me because as I started to turn from sin, as I started to turn from my desires, they started being like, oh, he's not really fun. I don't, I remember even my friend was saying one time, he's like, you know, it's okay to laugh still. And I'm like, yeah, I know, but I'm not going to laugh at perverted jokes. Um, and again, what happened later on in life, these friends that I was really close in college with roommates with, I don't get invited to their weddings. Right. Or I don't, don't get invited to anything, honestly, and love them to death. Have no problem with them. And, and listen, I, have I, have I invited them to things? Sure. No, I haven't. But point is, is this is what happens. This is what you lose. And I counted those relationships, right? Just in the same way of counting mother, father, brother, sister. I counted those brothers in Christ or just brothers or friends to be of less value than of knowing God. And I said, God, if this is the cost, I give it to you. Losing friends, losing status, losing relationship. If this is the cost, God, I give it to you. And it happened, right? And I know those friends, they still love me and we can be cordial, but definitely there was some rejection there and definitely lost some of those relationships. But that's okay because I knew that it was all part of losing my life, counting my life as nothing for the sake of God. And if they didn't like what I was preaching or believing, then that's okay because I could rest sincerely on knowing that God's truth was truth. And I, again, valued being his disciple more than having friends or having status or having people that liked me, you know? So, and, and even, even in ministry, you know, we've had people come to us and say, well, you're putting demons in us and, and, uh, other people talking bad about us having too much faith and, 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 uh, preaching a false gospel and, Again, it's all spiritual. Like, just go read your Bible if you have a problem with what we preach or what we believe because it's all right there. But again, this is the stuff that even Jesus said, you're going to be hated for my name. You're going to be persecuted. I was never hated. I was never persecuted. But this is what happened. I'm saying I was never hated or persecuted before um, following Christ. But this is what happens when you truly surrender. You lose your life. And you save your life by Christ. But the world will not see you as their own. They'll see you as an alien but you have to count the cost. Am I willing to let go of those things? Like the Muslim girl or boy that I was talking about. Am I willing to let go of all of those relationships? Relationships are the hardest thing, to be quite honest. Like dreams are big, but when you lose friends in the middle of that all, in that transition from being surrendered, turning from those bad friend groups, turning from those groups that, you know, bring you down or maybe sin and you don't want to be around that, 
that's really hard. And then the rejection that comes with that as you change your life that they don't want to be around you, that's very hard as well. But there is a silver lining. There is a beautiful aspect to this and we're going to get to it very, very soon. Um, just a few more stories. Again, like I talked about earlier, one of the next stories is not wanting to move, right? This was one of my comforts. I don't want to move. Hollywood's here. We have a big house. All my friends are here. I can do whatever I want. I love it here. It's sunny every day. You know, and my big thing was I don't want to move because Hollywood, I, I, I need to work in the film industry. I'm here. This is what I'm doing. Like, sorry guys, I, I'm not moving. But what happens? You, I gave my will to God and now God gives my sister a word. Hey, we want you to move to Montana. And it's like, okay, God. I mean, for the last year, I want you to understand, I barely had any work. I had, I made the least amount of money I've ever made last year. And I almost, I couldn't even pay my bills. I'm going to talk about that in another episode, but it was really tough. There is not a lot of filmmaking gigs out here. And that was my, that's my job. That's my prof profession. Um, don't get me wrong. I hate to go work at a restaurant, but this is what I trained for my whole life. You know what I mean? So leaving LA to anyone out on the outside would seem like the dumbest decision and stupid and, um, you know, totally Taylor, you're ruining your career. You're losing clients. What are you doing? Like, you know, even when I made the podcast, what are you doing? Like people aren't going to like you, like you're not going to get hired for these jobs. And I'm like, but I don't value my life more than I value knowing Christ. So I, I these are the things I have to do. The last part of what I, what I lost is, um, and I'm sure there's more to this, but I can't remember everything. It's been five years, but when we moved, we decided, hey, we want to pray about everything prophetically of what we should take. And we prayed about motorcycle. I had a motorcycle. I had a, a mountain bike. I had a fish tank that I really loved. Um, a few other things. But we prayed about all those things. And, and the reason I list those three is because God said, don't bring any of those things. Get rid of them. Sell them. Don't get me wrong. I got to keep the money. That was great. But that was really tough. I was like, no, like, I really want, a mo I really want my motorcycle. I've been riding my motorcycle since I was, I've been riding motorcycles since I was three. And, you know, my fish tank, I was like, that's like my only pet I'm allowed to have. <laughs> I mean, I knew there was really no way. And praise God, he told us not to bring it because we didn't have a house for three months. How would that have worked? You know, my fish would have froze. Um, <laughs> but anyways, again, this was just the idea of the comfort part of laying down my will of saying, God, I want to bring all these things. And I could just not ask you and I could bring all of them. But God, what do you want for my life? What do you want me to bring? And even the part of my will, like, I wanted to have my own life. I want to go get married. I want, I don't want to live with my parents, but God, whatever your will is. And now I love living with my parents, by the way. But again, it was surrendering. It was losing my life. Anyone on the outside that would see my life would say like, bro, what are you doing? Like you live in Montana. You don't have a legit job. You live with your parents. You're not connected. How are you going to meet a wife? How are you going to do this? How are you going to make money? Blah, 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 blah. But I know that this is the life that God has cut out for me, that he has planned for me. And this is where we get to whoever loses their life will save it. And I bear witness to this because when I was trying to save my life, I was losing it. I was losing spirituality with God. I was not connected with God. I was in my sin. I was totally losing my life and I was on a straight path towards hell. Whether I called myself a Christian or not, it doesn't matter. I was going to die in my sin and I was going to be sent straight to hell for what I was living in and for valuing my life. Because Jesus said, listen, whoever, even like you nice people are like, oh, come on, Taylor, don't say that. Don't be so hard on yourself. No, it says right here, if you do not hate mother, brother, your father, sister, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my, your, my disciple. I did not hate my life. And I'm still working on hating my life every day. That's why I made those shirts to die to yourself. Because every day it's a reminder. I mean, it's kind of funny. Every day I've wore it, I look in the mirror, I'm like, okay, yeah, God help me to die to myself. It's a reminder because that's something we do daily. Any day I could turn around and stop doing that. But again, when I sought to lose my life, when I said, God, I hate my life. I hate the sin that I'm living in. I hate my desires. I hate even just controlling my life because it brings anxiety. It brings fear. It brings control. I want to just let go and live for you. And the whole world's going to question it. Like, what are you doing? You don't have a job. What do you mean doing full-time ministry? You can't do that. That's not how the world works. Blah, 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 blah. God, I want to save my life. So, that, so by that, I'm going to lose it. So going down, what have I gained following Christ? And this is the beauty of it all. And guys, I, I just want to give you this because it's so incredible. And again, I'm, I'm packing down a very emotional, tough testimony and road into like a few minutes here. But God is true. He is faithful. And when he says, if you lose your life, you will save it. He is 
legitimate. My life today is better than any other life that I've ever lived. And I've lived a lot of different lives, been into a lot of different things, sin. The life I live in Montana today is greater than any life I lived in the world, doing what I wanted to do, fulfilling my own desires. And if only people would understand that following Christ and giving him everything is so much better, is so much higher, is so much more fun and fulfilling than anything else in this world, then everyone would do it. But they don't actually believe Jesus's words to be true because Jesus doesn't start with the reward. He starts with the risk. You have to, this is why good, there's, there's only a few good businessmen in the world because they realize that it always starts with a risk, but there's always a reward if they calculate everything right. And that's why Jesus is saying, listen, calculate the price to follow me. Okay. It's a huge risk. You got to let go of everything. You got to, if, if God says move to Ohio tomorrow and sell everything and quit your job, then you have to do it. But what he has for you is so much better. I'm like clapping my hands. I'm like, yeah, it is. And I bear witness to this. I have more peace, more joy, more hope, more excitement in my life than I ever have. And I'm going to get into it. So from my old dreams, I have new dreams. What are my new dreams? Knowing God, having a relationship with almighty God, new dreams, making him known. I want to preach the gospel. I want to be like Peter. I want to be like Paul. I want to be like John. I want, I want the world to know who Jesus is. I want to serve him. New dreams, seeing lives changed. And I'm going to tell you, this is the most fulfilling. I want to see young men who struggle with pornography like I did, young men who struggle with sin like I did, young women, young, young whoever, old whoever. I want to see their lives change for God. And lastly, new dreams that have come is God's implanted new dreams of new work that I love, right? I never wanted to do podcasts. It's my most fulfilling, my most favorite work I do. I never wanted to do photography as a business. I was always a videographer. Well, guess what? I'm going to get to this, but God's opening doors for me to do photography. And I love it so much. See, it's not that filmmaking wasn't something that he gave me and made me um, good at. It's just that he wanted to mold it in his own way. I just thought, oh, filmmaking means I'm going to go make movies. But he's like, no, no, no. You enjoy media, right, Taylor? Yes. Yes, I do. God. Okay. I'm going to have you, when you move, you're going to make YouTube videos of camping. You're going to do podcasting. You're going to take photos. All these different things that I never considered, never was going to do uh, in my old life were not desires. He changed those desires. And again, that's where we get to, to desires here. Again, they're kind of the same thing, but my new desires is his will. I am so scared and I want to so be in his will at all moments. Even if he told me, Taylor, yeah, you can't live in Montana when you get married. You got to move to, I always say Ohio as a joke, but you got to move to Saskatchewan. <laughs> um, you know, but I want his will because when I'm in his will, I feel peace. When I'm in his will, I know that I'm, I'm right with God and I want to be right with my maker. I want to be a friend to God. I don't, he doesn't call me slave anymore because slaves don't know their master's business. I, he calls me friend. New desires, living in Montana. Yeah, the, once I got born again, we started doing a lot of camping. And yes, I always loved Montana, but I wanted to do the LA thing. I wanted to move to New York. I was actually very close to moving to New York and working on a big movie that I also turned down. The, the door was completely open. I had the job and I completely turned it down because I was not looking to, to save my life on this earth because I felt that this that was not where God had called me to go. God had called us to ministry as a family and unity. God called us to unity, to minister as a family. That was very hard at the beginning because I wanted to do my own thing. I wanted to go to Brooklyn. I wanted to be a director. I wanted to work on movies. I had a client out there that was willing to take me under his wing and teach me and get me in the industry. And But I valued God's will, which was to keep us united and to keep us doing ministry. And I knew we couldn't do that if I was in New York. So I threw that idea out. A few other kind of funny ones. Um, and they're kind of dreams, desires, all the same, um, is I've always wanted my own dog and was never going to get that in California. And I kind of come to peace with that. I'm like, you know, when I get my own place, I'll get a dog. But that was something that you can ask my family. You can ask anyone I know. That was like top priority desire. I wanted my own dog. And six months ago, I got my own dog. And that would have never happened if we didn't move. And again, I know it's trivial and funny, but I want to say that God is so good at giving us little things that we desire wholesome things because he loves us, right? He sees that I'm doing his will. I'm working for him. My full time job is ministry and helping others to know God. And he rewards us by giving us little things that we wanted, like a dog. Like God totally changed my parents' hearts. And my dad literally even bought the dog. I didn't even have to pay for it. I mean, I do have to pay for it, some of its bills and stuff, but 
Now I have my own dog that I can go camping with and something that I desired so much. And he even changes my desires. I really wanted a Husky and we ended up getting a great Pyrenees and I'm so thankful. The temperament is so much better. But again, I gave up my will of thinking, no, I want a Husky and I'm just going to get a Husky because I want it. And I asked God, God, what do you want? You know, what's best? And he started to change my desires on that too. And he really made me want a great Pyrenees all of a sudden. It was just crazy. Again, new desires, family, right? Like I said, I wanted to move away and I wanted to do my own thing. And now I, I want to live with my family. I want to build my house on our property. I, I love my family. And the last one, this is again funny, but it's kind of like the dog. He gives us these little things. And I, these are almost the biggest things I want to preach because he's so good to bless us with these little things when we work for him, when we've sacrificed so much, when we've given up our whole lives to serve him, we've given up all of our desires. But it's funny because even when I'm saying this, it doesn't even feel like in the moment it was hard. But looking back, it's like, it wasn't even that hard to give up all those desires because God made it easy. God changed my heart. So I'm I'm really asking you guys, if, if this is you, just tell God, I give you my heart and start doing the things he's asking you to do because he'll help. He'll remember he's the potter. So when you soften yourself as the clay, he'll start to mold you. So he'll help you. You give him that hundred percent of the clay and he'll give you hundred percent of his molding ability. And so it almost becomes a 50, 50 in a way, because you don't have to do all the work. You're saying, God, I give you my desires. Help me. And he's like, okay, let me craft you. But the last thing is when I was a kid, my dad did demolition and, and he always drove a skid steer or a bobcat. Um, and I always thought, oh, that's so cool. There's even pictures of me riding in it. And I got to drive it up the trailer a few times when I was like, probably like eight. <laughs> um, but I was like, you know, that's super cool. And it was never a desire that I had after that. I was just like, yeah, I love, you know, I'm a guy trucks, you know, tractors, they're all cool. But I'm like, okay. But when we got this property, we had to get a tractor to plow the roads, to do a lot of the work that we need to do. And so we got a skid steer. And the funny thing is, is we got a caterpillar, not a bobcat. And I say that because bobcat and caterpillar have totally different, um, controls. And so my dad only knew bobcat and he's like, I don't want to learn a caterpillar. So Taylor, like you're going to be the driver for this. And that was so cool because it wasn't even a desire I knew I had, but now I find so much joy being able to plow the roads and use that thing because as a kid, I always watched my dad doing it. And I always was like, man, I'd lo really love to drive a tractor. And so it's funny because I could tell people in the world or people that I did filmmaking with about this and they'd be like, bro, what? <laughs> but for me, it's like, this is so cool. God changed my desires. And then he gave me these little things like the dog, like the tractor, things that I really love and, and bring me joy outside of ministry that are not sin, that are not my old life, that are not things I ever wanted, but well, I guess the dog was, but things that God changed my desires and, and, and gave me as a gift. So God will reward you when you serve him. God really does reward you. Last few here, relationship, right? When I first turned to God and really surrendered, I lost a lot of friends. I remember I was in college. I was just hanging out with my sister and her roommate and a few other people. I'm not trying to bad talk anyone. Um, but, uh, you know, I was one trying to be careful, little ears, what you hear and be around the right crowd. But I uh, also just felt kind of rejected and, and not desired and, you know, a lot of different things. I don't want to get into all that, but, but slowly as we started serving God and there was, a, there was a desert period there where it was just me and my family and a lot of people in our, we left our church and a lot of people in our church were talking bad about us behind our back. A few of our friends came to my mom and apologized and was like, Hey, I'm sorry. You know, I got to repent. I was talking bad about you. And this happened a lot. And I'm sure people still talk about us to this day. And we, we hear from it because we had a lot of friends and now we have a lot of friends that don't talk to us uh, from church and, and from theater. Um, and I pray that God's working on all of them. I love every single one of them so much, but you know, a lot of them rejected us and don't talk to us. And it was a desert period for a while. And people came against us, said we we're crazy, said they didn't want to meet with us or hang out with us anymore. Like literally said that. Um, and that was tough, but again, we didn't back down we decided we wanted to lose our life so that we could save it. And what happened? God started bringing new friends, the people we started ministering to. Oh my gosh. When you start helping people for Jesus, you get so much closer to these people because people always say, oh, blood is thicker than water, but spirit is thicker than blood. Like, I don't, like, don't get wrong. I love all my blood relatives. I love them to death, of course. But I am closer with some of my spirit-filled uh, brothers and sisters who we disciple than a lot of my family that, that I, that I have. And again, it's not that I don't love them any less, but God truly brings people that are united in spirit and cause and purpose. And you become so f close with them that they become your family. I mean, since living here in Montana, we have had probably 20 different people, 20 different groups, uh, visit us and probably over like 
50 or 60 people visit us from uh, a lot of people that we did ministry from in California. This is the amount of love that there is. You get new relationship. And I, I, ha- I didn't even mention, you get relationship with God. When you lose your life, you save it. Why? The whole point is because you get a relationship with God. There's nothing stopping you. There's nothing hindering you. There's nothing blocking your prayers. You have a one-on-one relationship with Almighty God, with the Father in heaven, and you get to commune with him. That is what you gain. You gain the whole world because Jesus is greater than the world. And now I have peace. I have a relationship with Jesus. I'm so tender. I'm so soft with him. He's my friend. I get to talk to him every single day. I'm, I'm kind of getting emotional right now as I just talk about it. He is the one I can always talk to. I don't need any friend. I don't need a wife. I don't need a family. I have God. That is the relationship you get. It's incredible. But again, you get new family with these people that are born again. And we have so many family members now that I'm so beyond close with, closer than I ever thought, encouraging brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters that only want to talk about God. They don't want to talk about trivial things. They don't want to, um, they don't want to go around sinning, but sometimes you got to be in the desert before God brings you these people. People are like, well, God won't send me good friends. So they're still hanging out with their old friend groups. It's like, You have to turn away from those friends. It's first the cost that comes first, then the reward. God doesn't have a payment plan. You don't get the reward and then pay later. You know, it's it's up front. And lastly, new clients. Lately, God has opened up incredible. I'm telling you, this month of January, I have made half of what I made all of last year in one month in money. And it's not about the money, but I, I use that metric to show that God is so faithful if we just follow him. He's like, Taylor, put the podcast first. I don't care. It doesn't make you any money. Put the podcast first. I'm like, but God, it doesn't make me any money. How am I going to survive? He's like, just put the podcast first. And I'm going to uh, bring up a verse to end this uh, sermon on or, or message. <laughs> Why'd I call it a sermon? Uh, I, I ain't on the mount. Um, but he's been opening supernatural doors. I have so much work. I have a great person that I'm working for, a great client. And it's all God. I mean, I love the guy to death that's hiring me, but... Um, I know that God brought him into my life to bless me and to help me. And, you know, in, ter- in turn, I'm sure for me to bless and help him in the same way. Uh, he might be listening, so shout out. Um, but, you know, again, he opened those doors, but they're different doors. I thought I was going to work in Hollywood, make movies, do all this cool stuff. No, like I'm doing very humble, small little jobs for some cool companies that I've always wanted to work for and really fun stuff. But Stuff that I never imagined myself shooting for or doing. But God's like, this is this is my plan. Once I'm able to mold you, this is what I always had for you. This is what I always wanted for you. But you just had to let go of your will and your desires. And I have new fulfillment in that. I'm having so much fun with it. It's amazing. And then last, lastly is the fulfillment. And again, serving God. I want to make this abundantly clear. Serving God, helping other people to know Jesus. This is the most fulfilling thing. Now, the, the scary words are, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and in the holy angels. If you do not speak about Jesus around your friends, then you are ashamed of God. But when you do, there is this fulfillment in seeing people changed, seeing lives change. Ministry is the hardest thing I've ever done, but I would not be still doing it after five years if there was not fulfillment. And I'm telling you, when you see someone get born again, when you see someone truly filled with the Holy Spirit, set on fire, nothing is greater. Everything is second fiddle to that. It is the greatest thing you ever see. It is so powerful. It's so beautiful. It brings you to tears every single time. It's nearly the same, but it's always awesome. It's like watching the same movie over and over again, but it's, but imagine if it was so fun and so new every single time. It's like, it, it, it's it's a paradox in a way because it's literally the same process of getting born again, but it's beautiful every single time. And what else, guys? Destiny. God has predestined all of us. He has a destiny for all of us. We talked about this in the last episode. Again, if you haven't watched the last episode, I really I should have said this at the beginning, but I really suggest you listen to that before you listen to this one, but you're already this far in, so whatever. But um, the last episode really talks on this, but God has a destiny for all of us, but it's up to us. Are we going to try to do our own destiny, which is to save our own life and then end up forfeiting our souls? Or are we going to lose that destiny that we had planned, that we had willed, and allow God's will to take place? And as I've done that, and again, I'm sure I still do things daily that are against God's will. I don't mean sin, but like some things I'm sure that I God has asked me to do something maybe, or I'm not hearing it cr- clearly. But my point is, is, what I'm trying to say is, 
I'm trying to stay humble, but I do believe that I'm more in God's will than I've ever been. And definitely on the grand scheme of things, like I'm in the right place. I'm doing the right thing. I'm, I'm following the right precepts. I know that I'm on the right track. And what does that bring? That brings peace. Guys, I have more peace than I've ever had in my life. I don't worry about anything. My parents are like, yeah, we're driving back from Texas. It's very icy. I, I haven't even thought about it once. I'm not worried. I don't have fear because once you give up your life and you forfeit your life, your life is not yours. And what's beautiful about that, the, the beautiful part is I don't have to worry. I don't have to, I don't want to say I don't have to care because that sounds like it's irresponsible, but I don't, I don't have to trouble myself with these things because God's burden is light. His yoke is easy. And this is what he gives you when you truly let go of your life. Stop trying to hold up your life. It's so heavy. It's so weighty. You'll never be able to carry it. And if you somehow make it to the finish line carrying your own life, you will forfeit your very soul and you will lose every item on this earth that you considered valuable. And it will all be turned to rubbish and burned in the fire. And you will also be burned in the fire as well. The only life, the only place to find peace is to let go. If God is telling you to quit that job, quit that job. If God is telling you to kill that desire, kill that desire. If God is telling you to forfeit that dream, to come off the clouds, then you got to leave it. But there is so much peace in knowing that you are 100% in his will, following after what he has for your life. And I'm speaking this so passionately because I want it to be so abundantly clear that my life is so much greater than I ever could have imagined. And I bear witness to if you lose your life, you will save it. And I know that that means spiritually mainly, but even on this earth, God has given me joy and peace in the tough times, in the persecution, in the trouble. And I believe that he's been doing these in the little things because when the real persecution comes, when the tribulation of the saints truly comes and we are not raptured until the end, we will be able to have joy and peace in those hard times. God promises a life abundant where you give up everything. You think Jesus was un unhappy? You think he didn't like his life? No, I think he had so much joy and he didn't have anything. He didn't have a pillow to rest his head on. There's joy, there's destiny, there's promise. When you follow God, you truly lay down your life, pick up your cross, follow him, you actually become his disciple, there are promises that you are now heirs to. That's the beautiful part. And this is where the relationship comes from. God has promised me certain things that I can't share on here, but these are promises that are sincere and that are true. And they would have never happened if I would have been in my own will. Yeah, that life might have looked cool to the outside, but I would have been miserable. But now I have everything that God knew I needed. That when God changed my desires, that he changed my desires to the things that he wanted me to want. <clears throat> so strong please hear what I'm saying and please surrender please hate your father, mother, brother, sister whoever, wife, husband for God's sake let's end with a few scriptures I'm not even really going to talk much on them but I just think they're powerful to what I'm saying here and, and again I bear witness to them with my testimony Matthew 6, 19 through 34. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Basically, don't, don't put your time and effort in the things on the earth. Put your time and effort on building treasures for the, for the kingdom, like a relationship with God. Fruit, meaning like helping other people to know God. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your heart? Have you forsaken your life for God's sake? Verse 22, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. No one. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And it's funny that he says money here, because it's like, wait, he wasn't even talking about money there for a sec, but... Because money is the root of all, the love of money is the root of all evil. And money is what really motivates many of us listening today. I will be honest, it motivated me in the past. And I, it's still a daily fight to say, God, like this money is yours. I don't want to be motivated by that. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink. And I can bear witness, I, I really don't anymore. Or about your body, what you will wear. I when I didn't work all last year, yeah, it was tough, but I knew still that God was faithful. 
what you aware is not life more than food and the body more than clothes look at the birds of the air they do not sow or reap or store away in barns and yet your heavenly father feeds them are you not much more valuable than they can any of you by worrying add a single hour to your life lol and why do you worry about clothes See the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, right? The richest king of Israel, most likely, um, in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. He was not dressed like one of these ever. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly father knows that you need them. But what? So there's a but. So he's saying, listen, yeah, I do this to the birds. I do this to the flowers. But if you want to receive this, what must you do? But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. So put his kingdom and his righteousness first. And all of these things will be given to you as well. So this is kind of an if statement. If you seek his first king, his kingdom first, then yes, these things will be added. But if you're just expecting, okay, God, yeah, you'll provide. Okay, God, I'm just going to quit my job. No, no, no. If you're not seeking his kingdom... Right, even Paul talked about this. If you're not working, then you should not be uh, expecting a wage, right? Right. But even he said, "I work for the kingdom, and God has provided for him." So that is a thing. The Bible does talk about getting paid actually to be a minister of God. Now, I don't request money. Um, I don't ever ask for it. But it, it's not. I don't believe fully wrong to make your living off preaching the gospel. But but seek first kingdom and righteousness. All these things will be added to you as well. Right. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So. I want to bring this up because I bear witness to this again. And I'm not even going to go into great detail because I think you go get what I'm saying. But I didn't have work all last year because, yeah, I was doing ministry, but was I seeking his kingdom first? I knew God was calling me to this podcast, this ministry to help others. But I had a lot of other things going on. I was busy. I want to do this. I want to do this. My desires, again, it's it's an ebb and a flow with God. It started to come back in and I realized God wasn't providing for my needs money-wise because... Well, if I'm not spending every waking hour serving his kingdom, then I have the ability to go get a job. But now that I'm doing the podcast, I'm serving God. I'm trying to do as much as I can for God, not asking any money in return. All of a sudden, what what happened? I rebooted the podcast in December. All of a sudden, I get tons of work in December and January. And yes, I believe those are completely correlated. And again, I bear witness. This is a promise and this is true. Lastly, in my closing remarks here, 1 Peter 1, 13 through 24. Therefore, with so Peter's talking to the church here, right? But I do believe that this applies to all Christians. He's talking to Christians. He's not being very specific. He's just talking to Christians. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope. And this is my call to all of you. Your minds are alert and fully sober. I pray that they are. If they're not sober, that's another podcast. No, I'm just kidding. Set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, what? Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance, right? So this is what it's talking about. When you live to seek your own will, to seek your own life, don't don't conform to those evil desires. Evil desires doesn't just mean sin. It just means against God's will. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed, but uh, redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believed in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Purify yourselves, you guys. You have been born again. Born again means you're different. And I can tell you this, and I I believe that anyone who knows me can attest, I'm a different person. So much so that my old life, those old people, they don't know me. They don't know Taylor anymore. The Taylor they knew is completely dead. He died in the water. He's done. He's over. 
So yeah, guys, I really hope that this encourages you just to close out. Um, this is my story and I bear witness to the testimony of Jesus. And I'm excited for the more things that God will strip from my life and the more things that I will gain in following Christ, not always just monetarily or treasures wise, but just we're all going to gain a beautiful relationship with God. And we are gaining that right now. The kingdom is here on earth. Uh, well, it's, I'm sorry. What I mean by that is I have connection to the kingdom through Jesus, right? I don't mean the fallacy that Jesus brought the kingdom and now we're living in the kingdom. No, but I can have access to the kingdom by Jesus Christ. So I love you guys. I hope this encourages you. Please, um, like I talked about, leave your prayer requests on the Instagram. We'll be running those prayer requests. I'll probably announce soon what days those will be. Um, but I think that's going to be really fun and I'm excited to see just how God moves. But guys, I beg of you, um, lay down your life, lose your life because you will find it. You will feel blind at first. And I still feel blind because God's in control now, but my life is so much easier on a spiritual, on a physical level. I'm sorry, because I don't have to worry. I don't have to toil. I don't have to stress because I trust God. So I love you guys. I hope this encourages you and uh, have a blessed Friday. Enjoy the sun if it is out. All right, you guys. Love you guys. Bye. Thank you everyone for listening to another episode of the Jesus is Offensive podcast. If you liked what you heard, we're on Instagram. Check us out. Jesus is Offensive. Uh, or if you want to check out our website, jesusisoffensive.com. Uh, we have more podcasts on there. You can check that out at the podcast page. Uh, we also have cool apparel and another collection we're releasing on January 13th. Uh, and if you like what we're doing over here and you want to be a part of it, you want to make a donation, you can go to our about page uh, and you can donate there. And if you'd like to get in contact with us for prayer or questions, uh, feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, our email is hello at jesusisoffensive.com. I really appreciate you guys all tuning in and we will see you guys next week.